If there's no testimonies, then I'll turn the services over to Clint. the third chapter in the 24th verse. And if a kingdom be divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house be divided against itself, that house cannot stand. Proverbs 6 in the 16th verse. These six things doth the Lord hate. Yea, seven are an abomination unto him. A proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood. A heart that deviseth wicked imaginations, feet that be swift, and running to mischief. A false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among brethren. Luke the eleventh chapter, in the seventeenth verse. But he, knowing their thoughts, said unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and a house divided against a house falleth. 133rd Psalm Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard that went down to the skirts of his garments. As the dew of Hermon, and as the dew that descended upon the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord commanded the blessing, even life forevermore. So, last time I preached a while back, uh, if you remember, I was preaching on purpose or, or duty. It's something that I've been dwelling on a lot lately. And the idea of, uh, I think as I put it before up here, uh, if uh, we're promised, you know, paradise after this, why do we have to wait around here to get to that point? What's the point of this life, this existence here on earth, if we are promised eternity. Basically, why are we here? That's the, the little question that I've attempted to tackle in the last several months. And uh, the last time that I preached on it, we talked a little bit about how I had kind of started looking at it as it's laid out in the Bible in three different ways. Uh, what is the individual's purpose here on life, that is what does God expect out of each one of us as an individual to do? What does God expect of us uh, as a group of people, as a church, as Christians, as those who have accepted Christ? And then just generally, what does God expect of the world, including those who are outside of the church, those who um, have not brought Christ into their life yet? So I, I had kind of planned this morning to pick up where I left off on that, but uh, the last couple of nights, I laid awake in bed most of the night, just kind of lost in my own thoughts, thinking about everything that's been going on. Like everybody else, there's a lot on my mind right now about uh, our country, 
about how it's affecting each of us as individuals, each of us as uh, families, um, and as a church. And so if my message seems a little disjointed this morning, I apologize, because I'm trying to figure out how to weed all of, or, uh, weave all of that into what I had already kind of laid out to, to speak about. But I think it fits well, um, still within the message of where I was originally planning to go. Those first few verses I read, and I've, I've got a lot of scripture this morning, so I apologize if I go through some of it kind of quickly. Um, I'm happy to share <coughs> verses again with you afterwards. But... Um, those four verses that I read to start out this morning, that was Mark 3, 24 through 26, and Proverbs 6, 16 to 19, Luke 11, 17, and Psalm 133, Psalms 133. Uh, I put those, those verses together. Uh, I think they show a real juxtaposition and uh, Mark and, and Luke both of those verses they're essentially just different versions of the, the same thing uh, much like the books of Mark and Luke that's that's the same message that's being preached there that the idea that uh, a divided kingdom will fall house divided against itself will fall. That's a little out of context there, those, those two verses just by themselves, because it goes on to talk about there. It's, this is one of the parts where uh, we're talking about some of Jesus' Jesus's lessons uh, and discussions in the temple. And I think there he's addressing the idea of um, false prophets or false healers, actually. And it goes on after that, he talks about how can a devil cast out devils. So the way that I, I'm, I'm looking at it is a little bit different than I think it's an original context, but the message is the same. And it's the idea is that, how it's being spoken about in the chapter is the idea of how you can use division against the devil, really. The idea that if uh, the devil's house is divided, evil is divided, then evil can fall. But the same applies to the other side. Any kingdom, any house, including a church, including a country, if it's divided, it will fall. That, that idea or that theory of united we stand, divided we fall, well, that goes back thousands of years, as long as society has been around. Uh, I think the I don't remember the Latin, but the phrase uh, Julius Caesar was attributed with it, um, was divide and conquer, we're all familiar with it. And it's the idea of that's, that's how the Roman Empire um, was designed to operate. That's why it was so successful. The Roman Empire, they conquered several different, well, at first in conquering different civilizations, different city-states and, and countries, they, they would go in and divide the people amongst themselves, quarrel amongst themselves, break them up, it makes them easier to overcome. But even after they had been conquered, even after they had been overcome, the way the Roman Empire operated, and I'm no history professor, my Uncle Mark can probably correct me on a lot of this, this is just kind of the cliff notes of how I understand it, but it was the idea that they let these, um, these smaller nations within their big empire kind of rule themselves and, and keep their own rules uh, in order to make them happy. Um, it was the same for the, for the Hebrews, just as it was for every other uh, city-state that, that was under their control. And... I think the, the general idea behind that was one, was that was how the empire kind of kept peace uh, without having all of these smaller nations within them rising up against it. But it's also how they kept control 
over those smaller groups. Because if those smaller groups would have banded together, they would have had more power to overtake, to overthrow the Romans who were controlling all of them separately. So the idea was to keep them separate and they can't come together and build up enough power to overtake to overtake the, the ruling class, people in control. Now there's a lot of talk today about that division. There always is whenever there's an election year. Uh, it's been amplified over the course of my lifetime, over the course just of my young adulthood, I have seen it amplify more and more and more. And part of that is because of the availability now of um, media, whether it's social media online, people can talk, get messages to one another a lot quicker. 24 um, hours a day news coverage on cable and satellite TV, all of these things I think have contributed a, a lot to just kind of exposing something that was already there. But it's also amplified things, made things worse. Where that communication can lead to unity, can lead to bringing people together, getting people all on the same page, it can also amplify the idea of division. It makes that much easier to do. Now, again, this is something that I think happens uh, with all elections, but seems especially divided right now, is people are put into camps. The way that our government is designed, um, we focus on two main political parties. We stamp a label on it. And you could believe uh, a thousand different things, but if the majority of your views or even just one really important view of yours fits under one of those labels, you get stamped with that label. And then all of a sudden, you're over here. Doesn't matter about all these other things that you believe, you're right here, that's you, that's the stamp that's on your forehead, that's how everybody recognizes you. You can be on the other side of things, and have all, you can have some of the same views as everybody who's in here, but <coughs> that one particular thing falls, uh, in a certain category, or if uh, a group of things falls in it, you have this label over here, and now suddenly you're this far apart from one another just because of those labels. And you have all of this area of division in between. If those two people on opposite ends, given those opposite labels, broken down in the simplification of things of just black and white, Democrat, Republican, conservative, liberal, whatever kind of label you want to call it. If those people were able to agree on some things, if they were able to come together and have a conversation, that could be a very scary thing for somebody in power. The people in power who want to maintain power do not want that. And so they encourage division in order to make it easier to control the people that they want to continue controlling. Now, whenever anybody says something like that, you're all in your own minds attaching different things to what I just said, just like I am. And when I say the people in control, maybe you're thinking of the president. Maybe you're thinking of um, the democratically controlled um, Congress. I mean, there's how you interpret the things that I said could go a million different ways. And what does that do? That leads to even further division because then people are not on the same page even when they think they might be. I think that's what part of our message last week was about was the idea that, uh, I forget the actual verses uh, that our pastor read right now off the top of my head, but it was the idea of 
speaking in tongues essentially not being as valuable to a church or to a group of people as to someone attempting to interpret those tongues and to spread that message. Yeah. Uh, speaking in tongues or any experiencing, sharing any kind of gift from God is a holy experience and it's something that should be valued and it's something that has value. But attempting to bridge that gap between people, to communicate with one another, has limitless value. As David said, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. So when I say that those in power are attempting to stay in power and have control by dividing us, dividing family members, dividing co-workers, uh, dividing members of our government, dividing friends and family, there are people in positions of power that are doing that. But that's not really my concern here today. My concern here today is with the supernatural. It's with the spiritual, with the eternal. Who is really attempting to divide us as a people, as families, as a church, is Satan the Antichrist, Lucifer. That is how evil operates. Because if those under God's name, those who believe the same thing, those who are willing to share that with those who don't believe, if those people were all able to come together and be on the same page and have the same voice all at once, there would be no more evil. There would be no more destruction. There would be no more pain, no more suffering on earth. And that, I think, is the ultimate purpose for our existence, is to attain that. Now, according to the Bible, that's not going to happen anytime soon because of those other forces in the world. When that does happen, I believe that will be the end of days here on earth. That's when the meek inherit the earth. That is when judgment is passed on all of those who have encouraged the division, who have attempted to keep people from communicating with each other and sharing with one another. So until then, what are we to do? Because that is the ultimate goal that Christ has given us, is to achieve salvation for everyone here, here on earth. To spread the gospel, to spread the message, the truth. To bring everybody under his roof. So how do we do that in a time when there is so much divisiveness? I want you to turn to uh, Romans, the 14th chapter.
Him that is weak in the faith receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations. For one believeth that he may eat all things, another who is weak eateth herbs. Let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not, and let not him which eateth not judge him that eateth, for God hath received him. Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth. Yea, he shall be holden up, for God is able to make him stand. One man esteemeth one day above another, another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. He that regardeth the day regardeth it unto the Lord, and he that regardeth not the day to the Lord he doth not regard it. He that eateth eateth to the Lord, for he giveth God thanks, and he that eateth not to the Lord he eateth not and giveth God thanks. For none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. For whether we live, we live unto the Lord, and whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live therefore or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ both died and rose and revived, that he might be Lord both of the dead and living. But why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set at naught thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, Every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Let us not therefore judge one another any more, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fail in his brother's way. I know and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself, but to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. But if thy brother be grieved with thy meat, now walkest thou not charitably. Destroy not him with thy meat, for whom Christ died. Let not then your good be evil spoken of. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. For he that in these things serveth Christ is acceptable to God and approved of men. Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace, and things wherewith one may edify another. For meat destroy not the work of God, all things indeed are pure, but it is evil for that man who eateth with offense. It is good neither to eat flesh, nor to drink wine, nor anything whereby the brother stumbleth, or is offended, or is made weak. Hast thou faith? Have it to thyself before God. Happy is he that condemneth not himself in that thing which he alloweth. And he that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith. For whatsoever is not of faith is sin. I think that chapter is incredibly relevant today. Now, Paul was speaking specifically to the church, specifically to uh, followers of the Christian faith, of how to behave as Christians, just like most of his letters explaining. Uh, how to act as a church, and he was addressing specifically infighting within the church. And this goes back to the idea of basically the, the, the whole school of thought that Jesus introduced. Well, the Pharisees stood for the law and order, and this is what it says must be done. Jesus stood for grace above all else. An attempt to do right, but an acceptance that man is imperfect, and that man will fail, and that man is not the one to determine who is and who is not doing right. Amen. So here in this chapter, that's being reiterated. 
You may believe that it's not good to eat meat on this day, but you're not the one to say whether or not that's right, that's with God. If you believe that that's the case, then don't do it, because if you do it and you believe that it's wrong, then you are sinning, and that is a sin against your faith, that is a sin against God. If somebody else does not believe that, then let that be on them between what they believe and what God has to do with them. Do not condemn, do not judge. That is not your place. But it doesn't just leave it at, at that. The idea of within the church of within the church of Jesus Christ of following the rules or subscribing to grace, subscribing to what Christ taught. It also reaches out beyond the church. In the eighth verse there it says, For whether we live, we live unto the Lord. And whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live therefore or die, we are the Lord's. Now in the New International Version, as, as always, a lot of times I like to look at different translations of it to see how it's worded. In the eighth verse, there they say, If we live, we live for the Lord. And if we die, we die for the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. For this very reason, Christ died and returned to life so that he might be the Lord of both the dead and the living. This applies to all of existence here on earth. Whether someone is saved or not, they belong to the Lord. They are under God's rule. Whether they share the same beliefs with you or not, they are God's creation. They are under God's determination, under God's judgment, under God's plan, under God's will. And so you are to treat them as such. When we're taught to love thy neighbor, does not say to love thy Christian neighbor, does not say to love thy neighbor that has the same values and thoughts as you. It does not say to love thy neighbor as long as you have the same political viewpoints or even same religious viewpoints. It says love thy neighbor. Amen. In fact, it's extremely easy to love your neighbor when you think the same things, when you believe the same things. That doesn't take any effort. That's why it's so easy to get along with yourself most of the time. Because you believe what you believe. And we question and we doubt ourselves. There are people with... Uh, multiple personalities where it might be a little bit more difficult to agree with yourself. But generally, it's pretty easy to get along with yourself. The reason it's difficult to get along with other people is because they have different thoughts than you have. Those thoughts are divine. Those thoughts that other people have are still from God, are still God's creation, are still something that God put here on this earth. And so whether or not you believe that they are right or that they are wrong, based on what has God, God has told us to believe, that doesn't mean that you don't love or treat with respect. It doesn't mean that you have to agree with them, but it means that you are still to love them because it is God's creation. The 13th verse in that chapter says, Let us not therefore judge one another any more, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. That is the action that goes along with loving thy neighbor. It's 
not attempting to cause any pain on your neighbor, not attempting to put a stumbling block in their way, not attempting to dishonor them, make it more difficult for them in any way. In the 17th verse, it says, For the kingdom is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. All of the rules, all of the worldly things. Um, and when I say worldly things, that includes religious beliefs. Because those are rules here on earth in this world to be followed. We've been given the truth in the Bible. We've been given the direct word of God. We've been told what to do and what not to do. We've been told from the, the mouth of Jesus Christ. To his disciples, what we are to do as his followers and what humanity is to do. But all of the rules of law, everything that governs mankind from the Ten Commandments to the U.S. Constitution to uh, statutes that, that are on the ballot today propositions in California. Those are all laws and rules for humans on this earth to follow. Instructions on how to behave and conduct ourselves. Now where those propositions today on the California ballot might not necessarily be from uh, the word of God. We know that the Ten Commandments were direct commandments from God. Uh, everything else in between in the thousands of years of history may or may not be God's direct word. We know what is in the Bible has been told to us as God's direct word. We know that God has a plan. But the point that I'm trying to make is whether it's God's law or man's law for how to behave here on earth. There are laws, there are rules for how to behave here on earth. That is worldly. That is still second to everything that is eternal, to everything that is of God beyond this world. And so because of that, whether or not we agree on those Laws, those rules of what to do while here on earth is secondary to all else. And the number one thing, the number one rule that we are commanded to follow is to live with Jesus Christ in our hearts. Once we have accepted Jesus Christ, we are to follow the teachings of Christ. And that's what this 14th chapter here is about. It's about saying that while well, all of these lesser things are still important in their own right, part of God's plan, In comparison to what is most important, the battle of good versus evil, God versus Satan, that relies on mankind coming together under Jesus Christ. That is what is most important. That is what is the purpose of for our very existence here on this plane of reality. So in the 19th verse of that chapter, it says, Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace, and things wherewith one may edify another. Or in another translation, it 
This is an amplified Bible, which I look to sometimes for the modern language. It says, so let us then definitely aim for and eagerly pursue what makes for harmony and for mutual upbuilding, edification, development of one another. Focus on that which makes for peace and what builds up one another. Now, Confuse the message that I'm trying to get across here today, uh, because I'm not preaching Unitarianism or Universalism that everything is okay and let's all get along and it's okay to believe whatever you want. It's absolutely not what I'm trying to get across. We and the Church of Jesus Christ understand what the truth is. Yeah. And it is our job to convey that truth to those who do not understand what it is yet. Yes. Amen. I'm not trying to say that in order to all get along, we should just go along with what other people say or do. What I'm saying is that we should seek peace, we should seek unity, and we should strive against division. Because division is a tool of evil. Division within the church is a tool of evil. Division within government is a tool of evil. Division within the world as a whole here on earth is a tool of evil. Because when people are divided, people with good intentions, especially when they are divided, then those with poor intentions can overcome them. So as a church, as believers in Christ, we need to be unified. Above all, we need to be on the same page there so that we can all understand that above all else, the focus needs to be Christ Jesus is the one true Son of God. Through repentance of your sin and baptism, acceptance of Him, we can be saved, and that is the only path to salvation. Amen. As a church, we must be unified under that. And all of the details that we fight over or disagree with, and I don't mean here within this church, I mean as in the world, yes. the church, those, those who believe in Christ, those who call themselves Christians. All of the details beyond that are not nearly as important as banding together for that one belief in the truth. Amen. Because that is what gives God's people power. Coming together as one force against evil. Yes. Now as humanity, including those who are still God's children but are without the church as we consider it. They are outside of it. They have not been saved yet. We are to make peace with those people as well. We are to strive for unity there as well. Not by giving in to their evil ways. Not by um, agreeing that sin is okay. But seeking common ground. Something, something that I think of when I think of this is in my, my job as a criminal defense attorney... Uh, I deal a lot with criminal street gangs and gang culture. And uh, over the course of the last few years, I've spent more time learning and, and studying about it a little bit uh, from a sociological standpoint and from a psychological standpoint. 
People want to belong. We are communal organisms. We have ears and, and mouths so that we can communicate to each other. We live in groups, in, in herds, flocks, family. We stick together. We attempt to. And a lot of that comes out of just basic instinctual survival. We have a better chance of fighting off a saber-toothed tiger if we all stand together in one group and everybody has a spear and a rock to throw at the tiger together instead of if you're separated. And that's been translated over thousands of years as we've developed and changed into the complicated people and societies that we are today. But that still exists and we seek to belong. We want to be part of a family. People that understand that, that understand that that is how humans work, can use that to their advantage to draw other humans in. Uh, there are a lot of people um, in criminal gangs that don't believe that what they're doing is wrong. Um, there are a lot of people that do know that what they're doing is wrong and it doesn't matter. People on both sides of that belief, they seek to have people join their group. <coughs> and they do that by giving them a sense of belonging. And they do that often by preying on those who do not already have a sense of belonging those who do not have a family, those who do not have a church. It's a concept that I think we're all pretty familiar with, that the, the idea of um, in, in impoverished communities especially, or places where family values are not strong, that it's a lot easier for kids to succumb to peer pressure and drugs and join gangs and things. There are people that consciously take advantage of that in order to recruit people. The United States government does the same thing. Whether or not their intentions are evil, I, I don't think so. Um, I, I think that there are people in the United States government who have evil intentions, just as there are in any position of power. But I pray to God that as a whole, our government is not going in the wrong direction. Churches do the same thing. And again, their intentions are not evil, but it's still whether or not you consciously do it, or you do it subconsciously, look to people who are looking for answers, who are looking for a sense of belonging, who are looking for somewhere to go, those are the people that can be recruited. And those are the people that can be recruited to just about any organization if they are willing to let that organization convince them. So whether there are evil intentions or just neutral intentions or good intentions. That is something that happens. That's the reality of human nature. So we as Christians, who have been charged with the duty of spreading the gospel, who have been charged with helping others find salvation, we should be taking advantage of this time right now, this time where people are scared where people are divided, where people are afraid and alone. People are more isolated now than ever before. Amen. It was already going that way long before with people turning to social media and their phones and people making jokes about sitting at a dinner table across from each other but staring down at their phones. It's the way that our society has been moving for some time. And in the last several months, it's been accelerating exponentially been quarantined we've been for for health reasons staying away from each other and isolating even more right now individuals across the world are weaker than they have ever been because they are isolated more than they have ever been that is an opportunity for evil to influence yes now that is also an opportunity for God to influence. As our pastor has said before, the darker the room, the brighter the light. And that can be taken a lot of different ways. You can apply a lot of different things to that statement, but 
Right now, across the world, the room is pretty dark. People's eyes are open more than ever, and ears are open more than ever. And we as Christians should be taking advantage of that. And as I'm always preaching, um, that as Christians we should try to lead by example. We should let our, our light shine so that people understand, especially in the modern world when we are under attack as Christians, so that people can see and understand what good Christ can do in your life. And I think now more than ever, Aside from reaching out and speaking with people, as Steve pointed out last week, um, suicides are up. Uh, all all sorts of health concerns are, are, are up. Depression is skyrocketing. In my line of work, crime, uh, at least prosecuted crimes, decreased in the beginning of all of this because there, there weren't as many people out there. People were home, so. People weren't breaking into people's homes as much. Um, it was a very strange shift in things. And then after a couple of months, more crimes related to drugs, more crimes related to domestic violence, child abuse, they started skyrocketing, going through the roof because of where people are right now. People are in a position of weakness where evil can take advantage. So it's our duty not to, just to reach out to everyone and speak and try to share the message, but to live by example. And during a time of division, when people are angry, when people are yelling, when people have been forced into a camp over here or over here with some arbitrary label, the greatest way that we can draw them into a life led by Christ is by leading by the example of peace, of not putting stumbling blocks in front of your brother, of loving thy neighbor, of spreading a message of unity, of coming together to cooperate. I'm not going to be able to get to go everywhere where I wanted to go this morning. Uh, and I also want to take a, a few minutes after the message this morning to talk about uh, some church business. I'll have everyone turn to... Uh, First Timothy, the second chapter. First Timothy and the second chapter. First, uh, let's turn to Second Peter, Second Peter and the third.
2 Peter, the third chapter, and the ninth verse says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to us word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So when I talk about our purpose here on earth being not only to be saved ourselves, but to seek salvation of others, to spread God's word, remember that God wants that for humanity, his long suffering. That's his patience for us. The reason that we don't just skip this step and move on to the hereafter, to the judgment days, is because he's being patient with us. So that we can save as many, so that as many of us as possible before the day of judgment comes can be brought into the fold. Now, turn to Daniel, the second chapter in the 21st verse. Daniel 2.21 says, And he changeth the times and the seasons, he removeth kings, and setteth up kings. He giveth wisdom unto the wise, and knowledge to them that know understanding. And now if you'll turn back to 1 Timothy in the second chapter. Exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. Second Timothy, the second Timothy now, two in the twenty fourth verse says, And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, <coughs> apt to teach, patient, and in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, if God their adventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. Now go over to Luke, the 10th chapter. I'm going to tie this all together here in a second. Luke, the 10th chapter, and the 18th verse and he said unto them, I beheld Satan, his lightning fall from heaven. Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Notwithstanding in this, rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. We have been given the task of sharing God's word. Along with that, we have been given the power of God within ourselves. 
over the power of the enemy. Power to tread on serpents and scorpions. We have God's power within us when we accept Christ to overcome the evils of this world and to overcome the stumbling blocks that others put in our way. And what we are to do with that power is to spread God's word, to spread the message, to show people that the power that we have, we attained it through surrendering to Christ Jesus. But, like it says in that 24th and 25th verse of 2 Timothy, we are to be gentle in doing so. God has the power, like it said in Daniel, to remove kings. We are to pray for our kings. Worldly government will all be overthrown one day. All kingdoms will fall. It's according to God's plan how that all plays out. Because those people in power have the ability to do great evil or to do great good, we are charged with praying for those people that they make good decisions for this earth, good decisions that will not only benefit our own lives, but will further the message of Christ that will further God's plan. We have the power and the ability to influence those people Amen. by spreading our message, by living by example, and the most successful way to do that is not by leading a violent crusade across the world and killing all non-believers. In some situations in history, maybe that was part of God's plan, it was God's will. Maybe at some points in time that is necessary. But that is not what Christ taught how we should do that. That is not what the disciples explained or laid out for us and how to do that. As Paul said, as Luke said, we are to use that power to seek peace and to seek unity with all people. Turn to uh, Galatians 
actually, I think I wrote down the wrong verse of where, where I was going next. But the sixth chapter of Galatians there, it goes along with the same as the 14th chapter of Romans that we were talking about, that the idea of law and infighting over how we are to behave here on earth as a church, how we are to behave under the rule of government is secondary to the greater purpose of God's will. I want to close with uh, In 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians in the first chapter, in the 10th verse, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. 2 Corinthians, in the 13th chapter, in the 11th verse, Finally, brethren, farewell, be perfect, be of good comfort, be of one mind, live in peace, and the God of love and peace shall be with you. Acts, the fourth chapter and the 32nd verse, and the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul, neither said any of them that ought of the things which he possessed was his own, but that they had all things common. Galatians, the third chapter, and the 28th verse. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. John 13 and 35. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love to one another. Philippians, the second chapter, the first verse. There be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any vows and mercies. Fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Colossians, the third chapter, and the thirteenth verse. Forbearing one another and forgiving one another, if any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. John 17, and the twenty-third verse. I in them, and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Ephesians 4, 
I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, even as ye are called, and one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. 1 Peter 3, 8. Finally, all of you be like-minded, be sympathetic, love one another, be compassionate and humble. Ephesians 4, in the third verse. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. In Romans 12, 16. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Now if you turn to Romans 8 and the 18th verse. this reading. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth and pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? But if we hope that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it? Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit? Because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the change of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us, who shall separate us from the love of Christ, shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword. As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Dear Lord in heaven, As a church, as a nation, 
as a world, we need you. Some days now feel very broken and uncertain. We are hurting, we are struggling, and we are aware more than ever of our own weaknesses and also of the dark forces that are constantly surrounding us, fighting to gain ground in our lives, in our families, in our church, in our country. We choose to stand our ground today and say no more. We ask for your help to set aside our differences and look to the greater cause, the cause of Christ. We ask that you would help us to truly live a life of love. We ask that you surround this country and cover us with your mighty hand. We pray for unity in our land that in spite of our differences, we would be willing to stand strong together and live out our days with compassion and with grace. Remind us to live aware, to redeem the time to listen to your words, and be willing to make a difference in this land. Give us courage to speak out, but to do so peacefully. Give us the opportunity to welcome others into your fold, especially during these times of uncertainty. And above all, help us to each live as shining examples of what Christ followers look like. And what can come of a life lived for Christ. We pray that you bring us all together, that you help us to realize that it's okay to disagree with some things and agree with other things, that it's okay as humans to not be on the same page, but to still work together. Please help us to recognize this. <clears throat> Please help those that we communicate with to recognize this as well. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Good Lord, we ask your blessings on this offering. We ask your blessings on those that have the gift and those that have not to do. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 One thing I think we're definitely missing in this country is unity. There's so much division going on. Do we have any birthdays we're celebrating today? If not, let's all stand and we'll sing There is a River.
us. Yes, let's remember Mark and Karen. They're going to leave tomorrow for the great state of Texas. And uh, Whitney Mitchell graduating uh, from college in Dallas, Texas. So she got a long way to drive. And I'm sure that Mark has cracked all of her mistakes. <laughs> but remember that to pray. You got to give her some prayer. He holds on for dear life. <laughs> I have four sick in the family. Let's remember Bruce, Don, yes. our pastor. Remember my family and the young lady I told you, she's still in the hospital, but I guess she's getting a little, the one that uh, Jimmy Hammond, and she burned 85% of her body in 33 burns, but she survived and they got the breathing too well. And her daddy right before that, because of diabetes, did a part of his leg. touch our leaders of the world, like you said, Steve. Yes. They need to become united and be Americans first and recover Democrats second. That comes from my head. <laughs> Go ahead. Steve, I lost a cousin this week from the virus. She has two children. Remember our president to his family. A lot of people out there wishing that they died. That if they claim to be a Christian, they better go back and read their Bible. God put him there. Amen. If there's no other prayer request, let's sing it one more time and I'll dismiss this in a word of prayer. <laughs> takes off, I wanted to give you a, an update on uh, I started to look into for the, the church that we talked about a few weeks ago uh, about getting everything sorted out on paper uh, I spoke with uh, attorney Jay Rosenlieb uh, last week He's one of the partners at my wife's firm. He does a lot of church organization things. He's on, uh, he's on the board for the Methodist Church, like the Western Region or something, and he, he does a lot of his practice focusing on organizing churches. So uh, I spoke to him. He gave me kind of a rundown on some of the things that we'll, we'll need to get everything sorted out. Uh, Rhonda pulled up uh, the uh, deed from the county recorder. So we have that. One of the one things that we'll have to look into, uh, it could be the, the only issue as far as sorting out the church property, is that uh, it was in the uh, name of the church before it was changed to Christ Community Church. It's one thing we have to make sure is all cleared up uh, so it doesn't cause any problems in the future. Other than that, it sounds as, as pretty simple. What we want to do is um, we would be incorporated 
as a 501c3 so that the church would officially exist on paper as a nonprofit, and that would mean that um, we, ha we have to have our bylaws, which our pastor ha has uh, some papers in the past, and then we, we take that and we, we're going to add in the names that he named as a trustees, and me and Steve as associate pastors. We'll basically have it laid out on a set of rules on what, um, what process to follow if we're ever going to change anything. And uh, all of that just gets laid out in a document. And then we register with the state of California so that um, basically the church exists on its own, whether or not everyone here that's here right now uh, still is here 20 years from now. And that ensures that the church, including the building, uh, the organization itself and what we stand for, the bank account, um, is all the Christ Community Church of Wasco will continue to live on no matter what happens to any of us. In order to make that process official, right now what we are is uh, legally an unincorporated association. Basically, we've just we've been operating under the same rules. Like if anything ever happened, if the church got sued for something or if anything else legal, legally related ever happened, all the same rules would still apply to us right now, uh, regardless of whether or not we were officially recognized. So this way we'll be officially recognized and it, it just protects the church's existence no matter who um, it is here afterwards. In order to, to do all of that, it sounds like it's going to cost about $2,000. Um, after I sort out the, if there's anything more complicated about the deed or anything else that we have to deal with, that might change that, but it sounds like it, that's going to be about what it is. So um, I just wanted to share that update with everybody, and uh, unless there's any objection to that I was going to proceed with uh, talking to him and then we'll set up a meeting some point in the next few weeks hopefully where uh, as it's laid out still our pastors Wayne and Sally uh, make all the final decisions but we have the, uh, the six trustees which were named um, a few weeks ago to consider all that too so I I imagine what will happen is, is after I finally get to meet with him and we sort all this stuff out, we officially hired him to do all the documents, then once we have the, the bylaws and everything laid out, we'll be able to, everybody can look through that and make sure everything, everybody agrees on the way um, it should all be written out. And then uh, they'll make it official and they'll file it with the state of California. So, does anybody have any questions or have anything else to say? about it for now. All right, I'll... Uh, Thank you for taking care of this for us. Yeah. I'm glad uh, I'm glad now I understand a little bit about it so that I can. <laughs> it's, I, I know very little about that side of the law, but um, Joanne knows a little more, and Jay, one of her bosses, knows 30... 40 years more about that kind of stuff. So I, we've got somebody very helpful that cares about um, churches in general as well that will be able to help us do that and for a, um, without taking a lot of money out of our bank account, I think, too. That's great. All right. Stay safe. Have a great week. We'll see you again next Sunday morning. Thank you.